Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Lessons from the Playroom podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in from wherever you happen to be right now in the world uh, to listen to our next amazing guest speaker, um, Dr. Joyce Mills. I'm going to be introducing her in just a minute, um, but we're going to be talking today about story play, which is um, a model that she has created, and I'm so incredibly grateful that Joyce has agreed to be a part of this um, conversation. So for those of you that are not familiar with um, Dr. Joyce Mills, let me go ahead and introduce you um, a little bit. Uh, known for her warm, uh, playful, dynamic, and inspirational style. And listeners, you're gonna feel that the moment that she starts, um, starts speaking. Um, she is a nationally and internationally recognized storyteller, keynote presenter, workshop leader, consultant, trauma specialist, and program developer developer for healthcare, psychological education, and community um, organizations. She is the founder um, and creator of Story Play, which she's going to um, share with us what that is and, and orient um, us to that in the conversation. She is the recipient of the 1997 Play Therapy International Award for Outstanding Career Contributions to the Field of Play Therapy Training and Child Psychology. Um, Joyce, what an honor it is um, to have you be a part of this and um, welcome to this um, conversation and welcome to this podcast. Thanks for being with me. Oh, well, I, I was saying I'm th and my throat has been a little bit raggedy too. So it was fun when we were talking before we both have, we both have our lozenges and I have my water and honey here and we're all set to go. So first of all, I'm really honored to be asked to be here. Um, I, it just came to such a nice time to think about how to start the new year. And you said that, you know, you had some openings during this time to and I just thought, what a nice, what a nice thing to do. And um, I kind of fumble with words these days, you know, a little bit. Um, I turned 78 in November, so I'm still, you know, orienting myself. Um, so everything for me is a story, you know, everything's a story. And first I'll introduce, of course, I know he's very, I'm going to knock so that people are only listening here. This is BT, my turtle, and he's my puppet turtle. And if you have no other puppets, you definitely need a turtle because the thing with turtles is they speak many languages and they're also culturally respectful and that you can do many things with them. So not all animals or, you know, I've worked with various tribes and people around the world. And I always like to know what do they feel is most comfortable? What is they? What are what are their special um, little animals or flowers or nature that really makes their heart sing? And of course, BT, you might not see it so much because it's a podcast, but I'm pulling his head in, and so he's in the shat. He's in his shell because he gets sh he gets kind of shy. Yeah, you know how kids do, right? He yeah. gets shy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Lisa, you know, you can kind of call him to say, BT, come on out. Yeah. BT, you are welcome to come on out. And it's also okay if you want to stand there a little longer until you feel safe and comfortable and kind of check things out on your on your own. Yeah. Because um, yeah, this is this is this might be new and new sometimes feels scary. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think? Oh, he, he said, yeah, thank you. He said, thank you for saying, he said this in turtle talk. <laughs> turtle talk. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. But I think I'm, I'm pretty comfortable and I'm just going to sit here next to, next to Auntie Joyce. I call her Auntie Joyce mm -hmm. and she sits with me and I sit with her while she can talk and I listen carefully. Oh. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you for being here. And thank you for being a part of the of the conversation. Um, yeah. Doris, thank you for bringing. Um, yeah. And, and, and just what a beautiful, uh, I mean, even as as I was getting to have the introduction, um, 
there was something so playful about that. And it just started to awaken that playful quality in me. And I'm imagining being a child and all of a sudden here you are pulling out, you know, um, your friend and, and just what an inviting um way to just begin relationships so thank you for modeling that in the sure. in, in the podcast that's what oh, it'd be a sure. way to start um thank you. I, I have a question that I um that I love to ask our guests um our guest our guest uh on this podcast because I just I love to know about people and I know our listeners love to know about people Joyce, what got you into storytelling? Like why, why play and story? Why is that so important to you? Well, geez, there's kind of like bump, bumping up. Uh, I can tell you many things. I've always been a storyteller. As a child, I, I would talk to people. Uh, I lived with my mom and my grandmother in the Bronx. And um, I was little, I was on the subway with her and I'd start talking to everybody. You know, I was little and um, and I just love stories. I love to things. So I would pick up things and I would make up a story, I, you know, for rocks and shells. But I think the thing, you know, that I've so I've always been a storyteller. And for me, stories are the medicine of the soul. Mm. Stories are the medicine of the soul. It's not things. It's not the technique. It's. The technique comes from the story. The technique is a story mm-hmm. when it's presented properly. So the child is invited in to any approach that we use. But I was always like that and making up all kinds of movements and dancing and singing and talking. And um, of course, I got bad marks in school for talking too much. <laughs> but, you know, then then I don't know how much you want me to say, but um I, I was a dad my mom remarried and I got was a dancer on American Bandstand the dance mm. show and I met my husband there and we were married um 50, almost 52 years and he passed away in 2016 mm. so he's still dancing with me in many ways and we had two sons and my one son was born with uh, special needs he was premature and I was never intending to go back to school, ever. I'm dyslexic. I didn't like school. And you had to sit still. So that was not my way. I like to talk to everybody. And I never like people's feelings to be hurt. That was one thing that whoever, if their feelings were hurt, you know, I went to them. But so, so to go back to school was quite unusual. But it wasn't until... A nursery school directress heard what I call the silent screams, the yeah. silent screams of a parent. Um, she she knew that I was struggling with my son, yeah. and um, because there was no identif- there was he was diagnosed um, with cerebral palsy, but but he wasn't. They didn't have what they have today. Let's put it that way. And so I don't think I was the best mother. I didn't know what to do. So she heard those silent screams and sent me to a wonderful place called Julian Singer Preschool Center in Los Angeles, my husband and I. And it was one of the first of its kind anywhere where they took you along with your child and, of course, trained you. Right with the professionals. So I was being trained along with people getting their master's and PhDs. And basically, there was one wonderful social worker who said to me, you need to go back to school. And I said, I hate school. (laughs) So I'm giving, you know, (laughs) I probably shouldn't say this, but it's true. I didn't. I didn't like it because I'm dyslexic. Uh So I'm a doer. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't the other, you know, studying all the time. But anyway, um, the thing that led me is I think my son is my hidden angel because he's what brought me to look at a deeper part and to go back to school and to really be passionate about helping the children. Mm 
But even, I may, this may not be popular, but even more than helping the children, my compassion, I could see the heartbreak of the parents. I could feel it. I knew it because I was living it. And there's nothing worse than, you know, having a child and you try A, B, C, D, and E, you go to all the classes, you read the books, and nothing works. And then you start to feel like a failure. So that's why I call those silent screams, that parents have silent screams. And that was one of the things that once this, um, Julianne Singer, once the therapist there heard that, I knew I was in the right place. And from there, you know, went back to school and, um, you know, it's a long trip, but and I have a second son now, thank God. And of course, he's not young. The other one isn't, isn't young either, um, but they're doing well. They're fine and, and not fine, fine. You know, they're kids. They're, well, I'm a mom, so they're going to always be kids. I don't care how old they are. So <laughs> I'm sure anybody's mom out there can identify. And maybe if you're, if you're a kid and you have a mom who says, are you okay? Is everything all right? You're going to understand that kind of comes with the territory, yeah. you know. Yeah. So um, so that's it. And I went back to school and um, I got my degrees. I, I got some degrees. But then I started to learn neuro-linguistic programming, too. I went with a group of 10 of us who were studying because I was very interested, of course, in sensory modalities and sensory issues and um, <clears throat> went to hear credible presentation. And then, and, and studied neurolinguistic programming for a very long time. And then um, Dr. Stephen Gilligan and Paul Carter came to LA and they were going to do a workshop on Ericksonian. And of course, NLP came from Erickson. Many people don't know that a lot of things came from Dr. Erickson. So, and Dr. Erickson had died that year and I couldn't get to see him. Wow. So I went and that transformed my work. Yeah. Because it was a five-day intensive, and Erickson's work is all based on resiliency, not trauma, which is what story plays about, which is what I'm about. He, he himself had polio as a child, so I really recommend people read some of his books. I mean, there's some writings about him in my, in our, my books, but there's also another wonderful book by uh, Dan Short, uh, and um, uh, I'm just blanking on her name, and I probably have the book right in front. Yeah, Hope and Resiliency. It's called Hope and Resiliency. It's wonderful. It's an easy book. It's a book to get into. And um, I highly recommend it. But it's the substance or core of the foundation of the work. You know, we all have those who um, inspire us to go further as a play therapist or as a therapist. Nothing touched me like Dr. Erickson. Wow. And and that that nothing, because the level of understanding beyond the conscious mind and not analyzing every move that a child or adult makes, but initially to find out what makes your heart happy. Oh. And to recognize that that is that that one statement can open what's what I call a resiliency pathway. Oh. Okay. We all know the trauma pathways, but this is a resiliency pathway mm -hmm. and opening. And, you know, we all study pe children or people who, who um, overcome, or I don't even know, like, like that word, but transform and overcome. And as you know, um, are able to take that hurt. And of course, that's what I study. Yeah. So, so the cases that I study or the communities that I that not study, but really immerse myself in what were, were was immersing myself in. Um, I always look for that light, that light. Yeah. So, it's so, so I don't know if I'm saying too much. <laughs> no, no, it, no, it's beautiful because it's setting the stage for um what story play is all about. And, and one of the things, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on here 
because it is different than the focus of a lot of other models that are out there Mm -hmm. where you're not so much just focusing on the trauma all the time and that there is this other element, this other core part of the self that you're, that you're focusing on. Um, Can we just go right in there into the conversation Mm -hmm. around story play? Um, When I was um, reviewing um, your videos and I was refreshing my own knowledge and understanding of story play, there was a word that stood out for me that um, I want you to explain because it's not a word that you hear very often in the play therapy community. So um, the, and I even wrote it down here, that story play is a multicultural resiliency-based indirective play therapy model. So play therapists are so used to directive and non-directive. So what does indirective mean? Okay. Let me just see if I can say this shortly. Okay. We know what directive is. A, A child, okay, let's let's just use for example, a little child comes in and and um uh, wants to and goes over and plays with uh, a truck. Yeah. Okay. And okay, so um, you know, non-directive would say but you're playing with a truck, right? Johnny, you're playing with a truck. Okay. Directive is the child comes in and is standing there, and there's tr- trucks around. And the directive therapist may say, and again, I'm just using this as a small, chunky, little teeny example. Oh, hey, you're looking at the truck and you you want to go and play with that truck. You can go play with that truck. Yes, go play with that truck. Another, Another one is in the indirective, the child goes over and takes the truck. And um, and set and, and first was standing and then goes over to takes the truck, and so the therapist would say, "Oh, hmm. So you knew just which truck you wanted. You just knew it's that one that you're holding in your hand." Mm -hmm. focusing on their their inner knowing and and honoring and celebrating um, Mm -hmm. their own internal wisdom is what I just heard yeah so that exactly Mm -hmm. so because for a child who's doubtful who doubts everything I mean I'm going I'm going to uh, use and these are called indirect suggestions Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not just acknowledging, there's a suggestion to the unconscious, mm-hmm. you know how. Mm-hmm. So for a child who has no confidence, who's been beaten down, who's been hurt, who doesn't know, which now let's say he just came in and stood there. I'd say, well, yes, it's really interesting how you know exactly how long you want to stay there. Oh. Do you hear the tone of my voice? Okay, that's hypnotic. There's a hypnotic quality that, which was Dr. Erickson's, he was a master at, if you watch his tapes, if you read his books, this this was, for me, the beginning, okay? Because I know. So I decided that in all my work, like when Dr. Richard Crowley and I, we started working together so many years ago, we were all in a group, and then we decided to go and create maybe um, a sort of um, therapeutic metaphors for children and a child within. Um, the thing is, is that we st- took every case home, every single case home, and we wrote stories for them. And in the stories, of course, there were metaphors. There were no direct stories. So it wasn't like, and not that that's bad. I'm not saying that's bad. It's just a different way. So this is this is kind of what was exciting. And we would take every case home, but then we would look at and say, okay, what are the indirect suggestions that 
would help this child or even help an adult, you know, because we tell stories to adults too. I mean, it, it was it was the language, therapeutic metaphors were the language. And um, and so indirect, that's that's what separates it. It's not a directive model and it's not a non-directive model. It's indirective. And we're always and all in, and this is a whole part of the study is learning to recognize and to how to recognize and utilize whatever the child is giving. And that's another Ericksonian piece, utilization. Okay, so that's a key element in story play is utilization of whatever a child is giving. Let me give me an example and I'll I'll try to be helpful. Well, I just I I am so struck by what you're describing. Um I I very much come from the belief that every action is wise and that that there and that everything that we do has wisdom inherent mm -hmm. in it. And mm -hmm. so even your example of the child just standing there. Mm -hmm. um, even recognizing that that was a purposeful action mm -hmm. um, that, you know, I, I'm just, I'm just really struck by the level of honoring that I'm hearing mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. who the child is. Um, oh, yeah. I think so often, um, uh, even in our field and definitely um, uh, culturally in, in different cultures, there's so many shoulds that are placed oh, yeah. upon children yeah. and so many expectations of performance or, you know, a therapy is, has to look this way versus this way. Or the mm -hmm. child has to do this versus, and I'm just, I'm just hearing something so much more, dare I say the word spiritual? I don't know. That's just mm -hmm. what's coming yeah. up. Right? It's like spiritual, yeah. like open. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Does it, does that, yeah. is what I'm saying? Am I, am I, am I getting yeah, absolutely. Of what you're talking about? Absolutely. Um, story play is, uh, has these elements of mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual. Oh. So it's made like a medicine wheel. You oh. know, I worked, I worked with um, indigenous people for many years and not just worked with as client, but with you know, and I lived in Hawaii for nine years, and I was blessed to live on the north, on this, um, the west side, which was very local and very wonderful. And um, everybody was wonderful, you know. But I learned. I didn't. I didn't go in as Dr. Joyce Mills, mm -hmm. and so I learned what is important to you, and to listen carefully. Um, that these that certain behaviors were not resistance it was a communication style and how could I honor that so they could feel safer or can feel that they could be trusting there so I and this is another key piece of Dr. Erickson's work you enter the world of the child the client the client doesn't enter your world mm -hmm. so you you as the therapist I have to be open to the world of the the client. And I will learn that way. You know, we'll learn that way and listen carefully to, you know, the way a child puts something down, you know, or like we said before, the way they just stare at all the toys, but don't touch. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting how, how important it is see there's no judgment like good or bad important it is to just see things that are before us hmm. Hmm. you know and then another story um, a story might come you know for example um an out an eagle can see in all directions hmm. and it knows just what to bring back when it's ready oh, beautiful so as you're acknowledging that's then where you're you're weaving in story and metaphor to help um a beautiful yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah 
Yeah. So it's, it's, it, you know, there was a, I tell this story. Well, I, I, you've probably heard it. This is my, one of my favorite. It's a Hawaiian story, the bowl of light. Mm -hmm. And that bowl of light story really is the essence too of, of describing story play. And it, it is from a, from a grandmother from the island of Molokai. Um, uh, her name was Kamehakua. And she was really amazing. I, I did from her books. I didn't know her personally, but as it is in our life, um, things come to us when, when we're ready to receive them, I guess. And I was on Kauai and um, I went to reach up for a book in the museum there and the book fell down and hit me on the head. This is true. Uh -huh. Opened up and there's grandma's face. And, and she's telling the book and I jolted back as if there was a recognition and, you know, people who know me know I'm a little weird. <laughs> I talk to everything and listen to everything. And so, um, and I was also as a kid, I had to touch everything, you know? So anyway, she, um, it's this, she tells this story. It's an ancient Hawaiian story and I have permission from the family to, I wrote about it and also tell it, but she says that every child is born with a perfect bowl of light. And with this bowl of light, the child can swim with the fishes and ride on the backs of sharks and fly with the birds and be perfectly okay. But in life, sometimes there are negativities. There are hurts and there are pains. And these hurts and pains become like stones and they get placed in the bowl. And pretty soon there could be so many stones you cannot see the light. And pretty soon the child could become like the stone. They say humbug, stubborn. But what grandmother says is that all the child needs to learn to do is turn the ball upside down and empty the stones because the light is always there. Nothing can take that light away. So that's the essence of story play, okay? Coming into it, not that I'm seeing a wound, not that I'm seeing a wounded child. I'm seeing a child with a perfect ball of light. Yes, the child can do it with that light, but there are stones. These are the hurts and pains. These, so they're not ignored, but first is always the light. And then as the work goes, we start to empty the stones. And as we empty the stones, we begin to see more light. But the premise, the key premise is not, is, is resiliency focus, is light focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you could tell I'm passionate about it. I, I think love it. I love it. I love it. It's, it's, it's... And, and by the way, all the kids, adults, even in all my groups, we made bowls of light. We use fish, self-hardening clay, and kids would come in and then they would make their bowl, their stones. Um, they would have, we would have a ritual, you know, over time to empty the stones. Yeah. And they had their light. So I, I love how you just brought that piece in too, because that was something that also caught my attention that the story is also um, creative and that it's not always words, if I'm no. any no. so Sometimes right. the story is the making of something mm -hmm. or um, the creation of something or the yeah. movement of something. The movement, or, yeah. Um, that, that it is not always a verbal story. No, no. Matter of fact, that was that was one of the uh, important parts is that how we use um, sensory acuities, sensory, the sensory systems, um, the sensory awareness. And um, that's one of the key elements also in story play. We may do it differently than someone, but definitely paying attention to um, what is the strength system? What's the strength system? What is the sensory system that may least be used 
okay? They least be used. Um, for example, a child who's always bumping into things, okay? Um, so I think to my, kind of as I'm working, begin to notice that what is the child? Now, it's not like I don't want to pay attention to a medical problem because we do. But the sense is from a story play perspective is that, okay, what is the child not wanting to see? Okay. Um, when, what, 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 what? I didn't hear what you said. I didn't hear you. But I'm talking right to you. Why don't you hear me? Well, what is it that the child may not want to hear? Uh -huh. so you, you know, you're familiar with it, but, but it's all woven together in the story play model. Each one of these are elements and, uh, or modules uh -huh. that, that are woven into the story play model. And, um, and I think Dr. Erickson's work, he was, because he had polio, uh -huh. he had polio and he also, um, learned how to watch his baby sister to learn how to walk. You know, you can hear many stories, but he did. Um, it wasn't like he just woke up and walked, you know, I mean, but it's that sense of the mind connecting to what works, what is helpful. And, um, and we, we do know that reliving over and over uh, a traumatic event causes a different kind of scar. So what heals you know, if we cut ourselves, I don't keep cutting myself open. I do what I need to do to help it heal so that other parts of my body can also send nutrients. Mm -hmm. I may not be using all the correct words, but it makes uh, complete, complete sense. Yeah. And, and as you were saying, the light, nothing's missing. The light's always there. Yeah. So um, how, how do you, how do you access the the, the light that heals the wound. How do you access the the yeah the, what what what's already there that is yeah. useful and helpful and resiliency based. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And also, there's something that I, I kind of threw in that I throw in you know each time when I'm train doing training, but this has been there for a while. Um, it came to, for, to me from a question. You know, when you're doing workshops, how you get the best question, like, or makes, you know, it just, it's a conversation. It's so inviting. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel so like I just want to get my tea and just sit down with you. <laughs> but um, the thing that's, I always ask myself if I have one hour with a child mm -hmm. and I, or a client and I will never see them again what do I want to leave them with? Wow. Oh my gosh. I want to like pause and have our listeners just take a moment and not just hear what Joyce said, but I want you to feel what was just said. Cause what you just said, there's a feeling in that. That's really, really powerful. So Joyce, can you repeat that one more time? And listen, sure. I want you to Close your eyes. I actually want you to feel what Joyce is saying because that is a powerful question. Oh. Take that breath. And just ask yourself, if I have one hour with a child and I will never see him or her again, what do I want to leave him with? Oh. I immediately saw the image of the, the bull with the stones and, and my heart went to catch a glimpse of the light, not, not stay focused on the stone. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and that's that's so important that's you know because many of us I I don't know about you I you know of course I've worked with clients that you know over a period of time and so forth but I've also worked with situations where I'll never see them again yeah 
So, you know, um, I, I, I worked with, in Hawaii with the earth, with the hurricane, Hurricane Aniki. I mean, I live, I got there 10, 10 days after Hurricane Aniki struck, transformed my whole work. Yeah. Transformed my whole work because I was now in the mud, in the dirt with the people and created a program that was based on natural healing. We were we were working with the discarded garbage, quote, garbage, the things that were all damaged and transform them. We didn't have an office. We didn't have, it was outside on the neighborhood center. And I was so happy with it. And the kids could just gather, you know, it wasn't a bunch of paperwork. It wasn't a bunch of this. It was doing. Mm-hmm. And parents would come, they can we come? Can we, Auntie, can we be here? Yeah, sure, come on. And we would find old, you know, things that had been damaged, things that had been destroyed, mm-hmm. roofs blown mm-hmm. off, laid them out. Kids would carry big um, uh, logs if they found them, stone, all kinds of things. And we transformed them into works of art. Mm-hmm. We'd have Hawaiian music playing. And and whatever foods we could find that people, you know, donated and brought. And it was so easy. You know, it was natural and easy. And I learned a lot. Yeah. I learned. So this is this is what so some kids you will never see again. Some kids I've worked with had to be go into juvenile detentions. And I had one session. But I always maintain the bowl of light, and I would tell them the story. Mm. And it's some I worked with very rough kids too, so they I'd say, you know, I'm Joyce, you know, I'm like me, Auntie Joyce. So they could call me Doctor or whatever, and but they most would like to call me Auntie. And and so it's like, you know. You may think this is a really stupid, you know, this is how I talk to them. Yeah, I know. There's some, there's some woman here. She's like, okay. She, and she's old and all that stuff. And she's which, so a storyteller. So, you know, you just, I'm just going to tell you to go along with me. And I'm going to tell you a story. Okay. And they're like, and then I change my whole tone. Yeah. And then say, I'm going to tell you this story. Mm-hmm. Every child. Mm-hmm is born with a perfect bowl of light. So you see how it's inviting them into the story. I'm not asking them to change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And they're my teacher. They were my teachers. That's such a beautiful story, Joyce. Just a really extraordinary story. Thank you. Well, it's my... You're kind of one of my favorites. Yeah. What I'm appreciating so much about this conversation with you is that the more we just talk about this, the feeling of what you're talking about is just naturally emerging in the conversation. I'm feeling the sense of resiliency and the sense of even, I'm going to use the word hope, even though we haven't said that word, yeah. but just the sense yeah. of hope and the oh, sense yeah. of possibility. And there's mm-hmm. just like an opening. Mm-hmm. The more we talk, the more, yeah. the more, um, the more uh, of an opening. I, I'm just, I'm just appreciating this conversation so much. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And, you know, there's also another saying, I think that came to me a long time ago, um, that it came, it came to me by sitting next to a man on a plane. His name was W. Mitchell. I don't know if you've ever heard that name, but you could look it up. He he was severely scarred and he became and had an incredible life, but became a, a, a really world known speaker. His one thing that wasn't damaged was his voice. Wow. And I sat next to him on the plane. He knew another dear friend of mine. And um, and I didn't and never knew him. But by the time I got off the plane. I didn't see his scars. Mm. And so, of course, they were there. Yeah. But I can't. So we started talking and I said, can I say this? And he said, sure. I said, scars are markers of where we've been, not where we're going. 
So what I notice is I never minimize, you know, there's no minimizing. I mean, clearly Dr. Erickson was in a wheelchair and he was in pain most of his life there. But, but the thing is, is that this, and I have scars and I'm sure you have scars and I don't think we could be more than a day old without having some scars. Right. Right. But so I'm not minimizing the serious the levels I'm not measuring, but I'm saying scars are markers of where we've been, not where we're going. And so we want to recognize, yes, this happened. You know, where do I'm going to go? Who am I? Yeah, I'm. I'm more than that. I'm the ball of light. Yeah. And then we help you know identify what each of those stones are. Mm-hmm. So sometimes they want to do it sometimes you don't like you say in music you can do it in musical instruments um in drums you know in making drums um all kinds of ways there's no limit yeah there's there's really no limit and if you don't have any you know the thing too is during this time where there's people that maybe don't have all the equipment and things that we need um <clears throat> You can just have paper and some crayons or whatever and just, but it's the story that gives it the power. Yeah. Not the, not the toy. No, not the toy. No, those are nice. But if you don't have them, what do you do? Yeah. You know, so I love that, you know, to, to give people, you know, our, our colleagues hope to say, oh, you don't have to go spending all this kind of money. You know, if you don't have it, you are the healer you are the story exactly you know you are the and i used to say to the like when i train i say you're the playroom Mm -hmm. you're the playroom yeah you know so you don't have to have all this other stuff yeah beautiful well joyce as we start to find a, a a wrapping up place in our conversation um, I, I, I want to share with our listeners where they can learn more about story play. Um, before we get there, is there anything else that you feel like uh, I really want to share this piece or here's a message that I would really love to share with play therapists that are listening? Is there something that comes to mind for you? Yeah, well, it's a story. It's a story that, that if, if if this is okay, it's a little story. Of course, and, of course. and I was, it's a true story. Yeah, I was in, I was in uh, Scottsdale Center a few years, number of years ago, of course, before COVID. And I was, happened, my family was visiting, my grandchildren, child and um, my son and were visiting. And anyway, and across the field, it's beautiful. And they have music there. They have all kinds of wonderful um, adventures there. And so I, I take a look way across the park and there is a woman with goth, all goth, you know, and she's looking down and she's blowing bubbles, just blowing bubbles. And as she's blowing bubbles, nobody's, well, they're walking by, they're not saying hello, they're not talking to her, but they stop and look at the bubbles. And so I, I, to 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 speed up the story a little bit but anyway my kids know oh I, I think I need to go see this woman someone tells me she's the bubble lady oh. is it the bubble lady I'm definitely going so I leave and I run across and it's a big a good distance I run across and I just slowly say hi I said my name is Joyce and um, and I said, I, I, I just was fascinated with the way you were blowing bubbles. And she, she smiled a little and, you know, she blew and, and she tells me, you know, her name. And so I, I listened to her name and then I asked her if she notices how people just stop and listen to her and watch her as she blows the bubbles. I stop. And she says, no. I says, well, there too. So she says, I says, can, can I ask a personal question? I said, how did she do it? She says, I said, how did you start to blow bubbles? She says, you want to hear a story? Honestly. I said, yes. 
She said, when I was a little girl, there was a lady on my street and she blew bubbles. Oh. She blew bubbles in the morning and she blew bubbles in the afternoon and she blew bubbles at night. So I asked the lady, why do you blow bubbles? And she says, well, if you look inside of every bubble, there is a rainbow. Oh, my goodness. And a rainbow is the spirit of all the children oh. here on earth oh. and in heaven. Oh, you've got so I bubbles. <laughs> This is what she said. <sighs> I said, can I tell that story? Oh, and goodness. she said, of course. Wow. And so there she is, the bubble lady. So I like to tell that story. Yeah. May, uh, may we all remember blowing the bubbles. Yeah, to look for the rainbows. Okay. So you see how all of it is wrapped in the same philosophy of the bowl of light, of the resilience. Look for that. Work with that. Yeah. A child is not the trauma. It's what happened to them. It's like what Viktor Frankl said over and over again. Yeah. All of the wisdom people say over and over yeah. again. Those are who I learn from. Exactly. Those are my best teachers. Yeah. And the, and the, best the, teacher. meaning, the meaning we give it and the, how we use it. Yeah. Forward. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. My goodness. Well, before we share with our listeners where they can find you, I'm aware that we have had a listener this entire time in our conversation. And I'd love to do a quick check in with our our friend over there who's been listening to our our conversation. How's our how's our friend doing? Our friend the turtle. Oh, wait, 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 wait. BT, how are you? How are you, BT? You've been you've been listening so quietly as we've been talking. Yes, yes I, I wanted to. I was resting you like again. this. I and then I came out. Yeah. And then what did you do? Oh, now he said he takes all of what he heard and he takes it inside so that he could feed it to his heart. Oh, how beautiful. Thank you, Lisa. Thank, Thank you, you for being a part speak. of this conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank so you. listeners, if you would like to know more about um, Joyce's work or to learn more about um, storytelling, um, Joyce, will you share your your website? I believe it's drjoycemills.com. Is that correct? Yes, yes, we changed it. And then then on there, there's like three, some links that you could get to, but we're redoing the website now. But yeah, you can definitely there. And my email is drjoyce at drjoycemills.com. Perfect. Um, you've also written a book. Do you want to mention the book that you have written? Um, individuals can go and check that book out if they would like yeah. to. Yeah. This is, this is, sure. This is what you can tell I was looking at it. <laughs> it's called Therapeutic Therapy. Metaphors for Children and the Child Within. And the this child is the second edition. Beautiful. I'll say the yeah. title again. Therapeutic mm -hmm. Metaphors for Children and the Child Within. Um, by second Dr. Edition. Joyce Mills. Yeah, second edition. So there's another resource for you. Um, and you do, there are trainings in story play. I know that you're yeah. you're in a creation phase right now yourself. Yeah. And, but for those of you that are curious, check out our website or send an email and Joyce can keep you up yeah. to date with what's being created and um, mm -hmm. where to find facilitators that are that are teaching and um, training in story play around the world. Yeah, yeah, they're they're in different parts of the world now, and so it's very exciting to see what what they're manifesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, yeah. once again, this is this has just been an incredible uh, conversation. Um, I, my heart feels really full, and I am so Thank grateful you. to be in your to be in your presence and to. Wow. Like, heard your stories. Um, thank you for everything you've done for the field. 
um, Joyce. Oh. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for honoring your own wisdom and creating what your heart wanted to create so that we can Thank learn. Um, I just super grateful for you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity and thank you to all who are listening mm -hmm. and, and who have given your time because they say time is the most precious thing we have because once you give it, it's gone. Yeah. And so thank you for giving me your time. Beautiful. Thank you, Lisa, for everything. Yeah. Thank you. So mm -hmm. listeners, as we wrap up, um, I'm going to invite you to take one more breath. Just take in the wisdom that you just heard, let yourself feel the power of um, the stories that you just heard, the, the, the visuals that were just presented um, for us to consider and feel. And um, wherever you are in the world, as always, take good care of yourselves. You are the most important toy in that playroom. That's and it. Until next time, everyone.